Today's topic is uh, on RAS inhibitors in the management of systemic hypertension. RAAS, that is renin angiotensin aldosterone inhibitors. Now, how old is this uh, system? The system has been present in the body ever since man has been created. But inhibiting this system has come into work for the past 30 years. And all of you would have been listening to lectures at least for the past 20 years on ACE inhibitors and 10 years on ARBs. So I have nothing much to add. I will just highlight a few points about how these drugs are being used. Uh, apologize for this uh, uh, poor slide. This is a slide which shows the renin angiotensin aldosterone system on four sites where its activity can be inhibited. Which means if you either block the angiotensin here or the angiotensin precursor before it is getting converted into the active angiotensin 2 or the renin directly or before the renin is produced. These are the four sites where they can be inhibited so that blood pressure could be controlled. Renin is inhibited before production by adrenergic blockers. Once it is produced, it can be inhibited by direct renin inhibitors which are into the market for the past three years at least. And once renin acts on the uh, substrate and produces angiotensin 1 which is a decapeptide and this is not a very active principle. It has to be converted to the octopeptide which is angiotensin 2 by the ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitor is an enzyme which converts angiotensin 1 to active angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 2 has got two major functions. Directly it will cause vasoconstriction and increase the blood pressure. It can indirectly increase the aldosterone synthesis, sodium retention and increase the blood pressure. So either you block in the end final stage or you block in the entry or in between. So there are four places where renin angiotensin aldosterone system could be inhibited to bring down the blood pressure. Now what is the function of angiotensin 2 in a normal person? Once we know that it is very easy to conclude how when it is inhibited it is helpful in the treatment of hypertension. Angiotensin 2 on the end organ brain it produces atherosclerosis, vasoconstriction we have already seen it involves vascular inflammation and hypertrophy and it causes endothelial dysfunction. So angiotensin 2 on the brain can produce so many bad effects and on the left ventricle it can produce left ventricular hypertrophy, fibrosis, fibrosis and apoptosis and the remodeling. And on the kidney because it causes efferent vessel constriction it increases the intraglomerular pressure and therefore it increases the proteinuria and therefore it also causes the glomerulosclerosis. So all these things are caused by angiotensin 2 and naturally when we inhibit the angiotensin 2 we can have the opposite of all these things which means the stroke can be reduced, the left ventricular hypertrophy can be reduced, the apoptosis and remodeling can be reduced and proteinuria above all can be reduced which is a boon for all the nephrologists and chronic kidney disease patients. Now, when we go into the evolution of drugs, from 1960 to 1980, the whole antihypertensive market was ruled by beta blockers, which is now having a dull period or a lull period. Now, 1980, early 1980, the, beta the ACE inhibitors were introduced, even though it was highlighted after the HOPE trial by Salim Yusuf, after 1990, it has really hit the market. Now, late 1990s, the ARBs came into market. And in 2007, the direct renin inhibitors have come into the market. Now, starting from 1940s with uh, a peripheral sympatholytic agents and ganglion blockers, which we are using only in resistant type of hypertension nowadays, followed by thiazide diuretics in 1957, which are still ruling the market of antihypertensive drugs, a dull period for beta blockers, and now currently it is being reined by the ACE inhibitors and ARBs and direct renin inhibitors. Now, when did they disco discover this? One of the major discoveries of this century in cardiovascular pharmacology was the isolation of the ACE inhibitor from the snake venom Bothrops jararaca. Bothrops jararaca is a South American viper which is mainly seen in Paraguay. From this only, in 1980s, early 1980s, they found out the ACE inhibitor. 
In the early 1980s, the first ACE inhibitor, captopril, was introduced. And uh, this is the Bible for all of us cardiologists. In Lionel Lopi says, in his uh, book on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor introduction, he says, in my opinion, this class of drugs has earned the labeling, labeling of cardioprotective drug of the 1990s. There is no doubt about it. It is not just a treatment. It is protection of the cardiovascular system. Now, what is vasoprotection? Today, nobody is worried about the chronological aging. Everybody is worried about the vascular aging. I see many of my teachers here who have never aged vascular-wise, but they have only aged chronologically, thanks to probably ACE inhibitors and their method of living. And the vasoprotection, vascular protective effects of angiotensin 2 blockade, we have already seen, just to mention them again, is direct anti-atherogenic effect, anti-proliferative effect, restoration of endothelial function, actually it is restoration of endothelial dysfunction, protection from plaque rupture, anti-platelet effects, anti-hypertensive effects, and decreased oxidative damage in general. And reno protection, we have already seen, it decreases proteinuria, it decreases the activity of tube low granular feedback, and decreased mesangial influx of macromolecules, and decreased formation of superoxide anions. So, summary to the unique features of the ideal angiotensin receptor blockers are, it's a double, it causes a double digit decrease in blood pressure for 24 hours, early morning risk coverage is there, superior AT1 receptor binding, no dosage adjustment for hepatically and renally impaired patients, no drug to drug interaction or no drug food interaction, and BP reduction without changing the circadian rhythm, excellent tolerability and high response rates, better end organ protection, and 24 hour risk coverage with once daily dosing. Because whenever we require an anti-hypertensive drugs, many people take it only from the day of the prescription that is being written for a few more days, a weeks, and still better patients take for a few months and then come and tell us when they develop the complication. You gave the drug, I felt very well, and then, then I stopped the drug. So better tolerance, we will have to insist that the treatment is lifelong, so that the life is long, and also we tell them it is better taken only once a day, then they are able to follow it. Now, as I told you, I am not uh, going to give you all the details about IRBs and AC inhibitors with which you have been bored for at least 10 years of listening to that. The summary of this is, all-cause mortality, when you give a drug, whether it re definitely reduces the all-cause mortality, you have seen the 88,860 patients with 7 AC inhibitor trial, AC inhibitor is better than the control. And the p-value is very significant. It definitely improves uh, all-cause mortality, which has been done with most of the available ACE inhibitors. Now come to AR ARB with uh, 77,000 patients. It is still better marginally. So it is just still better marginally than the control in reducing the all-cause mortality. Then what is the conclusion of this? Among RAS inhibitors, only ACE inhibitors have demonstrated a significant 6% mortality reduction in hypertensive patients. No significant reduction in all-cause mortality with the ARB, but still it, has, it shows a marginal improvement in the all-cause mortality. Perindopril significantly reduced all-cause mortality by 13% among contemporary patients with arterial hypertension. Treatment with ACE inhibitors would additionally save 12 lives for every 1,000 patients treated for 4 years. Now, this BPLTTC, that is Blood Pressure Lowering Treatment Trial is Collaboration Committee, has analyzed 29 trials and had concluded like this. Similar net effects on total cardiovascular events with ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, diuretics and beta blockers. ARB is also effective in reducing total cardiovascular events. Calcium channel blockers may be less effective for prevention of heart failure, but more effective for stroke prevention. This is mainly due to larger reductions in the BP, where there is larger reduction in stroke. So size of reduction of BP is more important than the choice of the drug. Most important is how much it is able to reduce. Now, the same meta-analysis given in uh, uh, this graphical way, you can see the stroke is reduced both by the ACE inhibitor and by the ARBs, you can see there is a 1% reduction with the ACE inhibitor and a 2% reduction. This is of the analysis of 29 trials, not a single trial. And heart failure is definitely reduced 
very much by both the things. That is why they are first introduced in the treatment of heart failure. And when it comes to coronary artery disease, it is definitely reduced by the ACE inhibitors. And probably, there is a big controversy about this, probably by the angiotensin receptor blockers. Now, what is the original thinking when ACE inhibitors were introduced? When ACE inhibitors were introduced in 1980, the original thinking was that it is effective in unilateral renal artery stenosis. How did they think about it? You all should be remembering the gold blood kidney in which you tie one kidney and produce ischemia. That kidney produces a lot of, lot of renin and increased secretion of renin leads on to increase the angiotensin too. That means the contralateral kidney functions more to maintain the blood pressure and therefore they, receive, they developed high blood pressure. So the original thinking was, if you can give the ACE inhibitor to these patients, you will cause a slight reduction in the BP to the affected kidney, where there is unilateral renal artery stenosis, but you will make the other kidney function better by controlling the excessive angiotensin that has been secreted by the ischemic kidney. Is that true? Then they found the damage to the affected kidney can be much more if the patient has been pre-treated with the diuretics and if the patient has got a low sodium. But even today, if a patient has got unilateral renal artery stenosis, you can still use ACE inhibitors or ARBs provided you can, you should not have used diuretic and that patient should not, should have a normal sodium. That is the take home message that is uh, now rethinking after 1977. Now, ACE inhibitors in unilateral renal artery stenosis, the, it is expected that the ACEA will adversely influence these patients, but the ACEA could be initiated without diuretics and with patients on normal sodium diet. This will remove the adverse effects of excess circulation angiotensin 2 on the normal contralateral kidney. Then can we use it in bilateral renal artery stenosis, preferable to avoid, because what happens is, when you expose a patient, you do not know, you are not investigated with renal Doppler study, you are exposing the patient on ACE inhibitor. Within two months time, the patient comes with worsening renal functions. The diagnosis is most probably the patient has got bilateral renal artery stenosis. So, need not, you, if you are not done a renal artery Doppler before starting a younger patient or even a older patient with bilateral atherosclerotic artery, renal artery stenosis, if he comes with a problem of renal failure, sudden onset, acute onset within two months, the best thing is probable diagnosis with bilateral renal artery stenosis, better avoid, investigate further and change over to some other drug. Now choice of initial drug, there had always been a question with every JNC, which drug to use first. Now all the collaborative studies have clearly proven all the drugs are equal in reducing the blood pressure if given in moderate doses. So whatever you want to use, that is why JNC7 will finally say it is the physician's discretion to use the recommended drug. But how do we select from? There are certain things that we can go by. In the past, size of the initial drug was largely based on the perceived differences in the efficacy of lowering BP and the likelihood of side effects. So if the side effects are more, you we may not tend to use it. Now, most trials have found that moderate doses of all classes of drugs provide similar efficacy, that is to lower the BP by at least 10% in most patients. So, more reduction than that, the patient is not able to tolerate. Less reduction, the doctor is not able to tolerate. Thus, any group of drug could be the choice of initial drug, except probably a lone beta blocker. The person who is going to talk about beta blocker is going to fire me. Combination therapy. Now the next question is whether our drug can be combined with other drugs. A low dose of thiazide diuretic potentiates the effects of all other drug classes. So this is the most important why a lone beta blocker is never advised. When a beta blocker is combined with a diuretic, the effect is as good as any other drug that is given as a single or a first line drug. But when you don't combine it, naturally like atinolol, it loses its effect. So, a low dose diuretic can be combined with a second choice drug widely advocated and is used. That is why a lot of combination with hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothalidone better still is now available with a drug A, C or beta blocker. Now against this is the accomplished trial. In accomplished trial they tried two arms, one with the benzer benzapril and amlodipine and the other one with the ACE inhibitor and a diuretic. 
Now, what happened? Yes, inhibitor benzapril and calcium channel blocker provided a 20% greater reduction in the relative rates of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality than the same benzapril and diuretics. Therefore, despite equal reductions in BP with the two combinations, this combination of calcium channel blocker with amlodipine provided a 20% greater reduction. So, what is the conclusion? You, the first and second choice will be a ACE inhibitor ARB plus a calcium channel blocker and would be the initial and the second drug and diuretic would be the third choice. Today, the person who is going to talk about combination treatment will definitely talk about polypill of all these three things. A, bit, a calcium channel blocker, an ACE inhibitor or an ARB and then a diuretic. Now, why diuretic in the third is uh, after the accomplished trial. Now, once daily dosing. So, these are the problem. Which one to start first? Can it be a single drug and can it be combined with other drug? Now, once daily dosage, when it comes, most available drugs in all the classes provide the full 24-hour efficacy. The prudent course is to document the patient's response at the end of dosing interval on the next day with this abrupt surge in BP could be avoided. Now, everybody says, when you want to give a single drug to hypertensives, give it in the night so that the patient says, he, so that we, the physician gets the satisfaction that early morning surge of BP could be controlled. But many of our patients feel comfortable by taking a drug after the breakfast. They do not take it in the night. So what we have to do is to find out whether it really has got a 24-hour coverage before he takes the next morning dosage. We will have to call him and recheck the BP at least on two or three different occasions and ensures our, ensure ourselves and the patient that there is a real 24-hour coverage. That is why today people prefer Olmisatan because they say it covers for 36 hours. Even if the patient forgets a dosage, it still controls the blood pressure for a prolonged time. So, it is our duty to call the patient and recheck whether there is really a 24-hour action of these proposed drugs. Now, uh, this is again a poor slide, which is to highlight the guidelines today after all these uh, trials. Initial drug of choice in uncomplicated hypertension and initial drug of choice in patients with diabetes. When you take the National Heart Foundation of Australia, the initial drug of choice in uncomplicated hypertension is ACE inhibitors, ARB, calcium channel blocker and diuretics. Diabetes, ACE inhibitors and ARB. Canadian recommendation, diuretics, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARB and CCB, choose whatever you want. When, when it comes to diabetes, ACE inhibitors and ARBs. European Society of Hypertension, what it says is all major classes including diuretics, beta blockers, calcium channel, ACE inhibitors and ARBs and all major classes here also. The British Society guideline and the NICE guideline, National Institute of Clinical Excellence against from Britain, both of them say the same thing. Less than 55 years old on non-blacks, ACE inhibitors or ARBs or beta blockers. Less than 55 years old or blacks, you try diuretics and beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. So, yes, inhibitors and ARBs, even in there for diabetic people. The JNC7, the first choice is diuretic. WHO, the first choice is diuretics. And initial drug of choice is combination of medications that should be an ACE inhibitor or ARB-based regimen in both the things. So, majority are accepting. You can use any drug at your discretion because all of them reduce the BP to the same level. So, use them in moderate doses. But in diabetics, prefer to use AC inhibitors and ARB, even in other patients also, non-diabetic also, if you can achieve a very good blood pressure control, please use AC inhibitors and ARB. Now, the other question is, uh, Professor Palajani has already told, uh, talked about uh, loss of libido. The next is diabetes. Which are the drugs that antihypertensives that can produce uh, diabetes, new onset diabetes? One, two things that do not produce is ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So, we would prefer to use those drugs rather than a odds ratio which is in favor of diuretics and beta blockers and mildly towards calcium channel blockers. So, prefer to use a drug which will not produce a new onset of diabetes. Right. What is the paradox? A paradox was created in 2006 circulation that ARBs may increase the risk of myocardial infarction. And then another paradox was a meta-analysis of large number of patients in the ARB trial suggested that telmisartan, losartan, candisartan, valsartan may be associated with cancer incidence and mortality in 2010 oncology publications. Where do we stand now? Now, recent evidence is conclusion from meta-analysis in BMJ in May 2011 
there is firm evidence to refute the hypothesis of ARBs increasing the risk of MI, ruling out even a 0.3% absolute increase. So, it does not increase the cardiovascular event, especially MI. Compared with controls, ARBs reduce the risk of stroke, heart failure and new onset diabetes. Cardiovascular news, 13th June 2011, FDA concludes no cancer risk with ARBs from meta-analysis of 31 clinical data. This is uh, what is uh, from the FDA on uh, 13th of, on 2nd of June 2011, the US Food and Drug Administration today announced that a group of medication used to control high pressure called ARBs do not increase the risk of developing cancer in patients using medications after going through 155,000 patients in 31 trials. So, will these two groups of drugs will stand the test of time like the digoxin which is more than 200 years old or like the aspirin which was found out even though during the period of uh, Socrates in 1853 it was, invest, it was found out as a chemical and 1899 Bayer called it as aspirin and is selling all around the world more than for 100 years now in cardiovascular medicine and the third drug that is still standing the test of time is what was introduced in 1867 by Lord Brunton nothing but amyl nitrate today in the best of the forms uh, nitrate so will this ARBs and ACE inhibitors will they stand the test of time like these three drugs we have to wait and see I think they have already stood for 30 years thank you